All right, welcome to our next video on our series in programming in Java. Uh, this is a continuation of some of our work we've done with conditional statements. So <clears throat> at this point, we should have a concept of uh, variables, for loops. Uh, we've probably seen the while loop at this point. Um, and we've just recently been introduced to conditional statements, which we know are if and if else. And they are opportunities to allow our code to branch, meaning that if given conditions are met, we can execute some optional code with an if statement, which the analogy I like to use in the classroom is that we call the if st statement a optional detour that your code can take. If this is right, go to do this detour and then come back to the mainstream of your code and continue execution. We know that if else is not as much a detour as it is a fork in the road. You're either going to go one way or you're going to go the other. But uh, it's not optional. Either it's true and you'll take the if or it's false and you'll take the else. That's how that works there. The other thing that we know is that uh, we can chain together if statements to create not just a two-pronged fork for our code to choose between, but we could make many options. If this is true, try this. Else, if that is true, try that. And so on and so forth. So you don't just have options A and B. You have options A, B, C, D, and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and run this video like I would a normal class video, which means that when there is work to be tried, I will pause uh, and stop talking for a moment so that you can pause the video, we'll try and work out the problem in your notebook, and see what you come up with. So the warm-up for today is why is this poor design? We have a method here. His name is bang. It takes a parameter that's a Boolean. Whoa, go back. That's a parameter that's a Boolean. And uh, it returns a value. And we want to know what's wrong with it. So I'll pause talking here. Write down an answer in your notebook. See if you can figure out what's wrong with this. And then hit play when you're ready to hear the answer. All right, so there are a great, great many options uh, for improving this code. Uh, it has, its flaws are, are many. Uh, but let's, let's talk for a second about what, what is it this method is trying to do. So we take an, a, a variable B, and if ever you get a confusing piece of code like this, it's my recommendation to go ahead and just make up some parameter values, pass them in, and watch what the code does. So let's say the actual parameter passed to bang is true. Let's say that the value B is currently holding true. Well, then we're going to ask the question if B is not equal to true. So is true not equal to true? All right, as confusing as that sounds, that's false. Remember, not equal asks the question, are they different? If they're different, then it would evaluate to true. If they are the same, it evaluates to false. So true not equal to true does evaluate to false, which means we get to head down to this else. And then we ask if B is equal equal to true, which in this case it is, right? Uh, true equal equal true, that is true. All right, so we get to enter into the body of the loop right here, B equals equals true. So then it's going to say return B equals equals false. All right, well, we said that B was true. Is true the same as false? It's not. So it's going to return false, meaning if I pass in a value of true, I get false. Well, what happens if I pass in false? Okay, let's test it. Is false not equal to true? That's true. They're different. False and true are different. Therefore, that's true, which means we're going to enter this if body right here. And then we're going to return is B not equal to true. Well, let's see here, false not equal to true, that's true. So if I put in uh, B is false, then I'm gonna return the value of true. Now, you just had to hear me say the words true and false about 100 times, and I'm sure you're confused. But the summary of it, of it is, if the parameter was true, we're returning false. If the parameter was false, we're returning true. And maybe at this point we can see now why I named this method bang. Recall that bang is the slang in programming for the exclamation point, 
the exclamation point is a logical operator that inverts a Boolean value. So bang true is false. Bang false is true. It's a way of flipping the values. So I made, I made this method to try to perform the function of the exclamation point. But I think probably right away we can see there's a lot of major, major problems. First of all, uh, th these return statements could be way simplified. We know that if we've gotten into this top return statement, that we should be returning true because B was false. So instead of saying return B not equals true, I think we could just say return false. Uh, down here, we know that if, um, oh wait, did I, just, did I just flip that? I know, see here's the thing with these booleans, it's crazy. Let's run it one more time just to make sure. B is false, false not equal to true is true. Uh, false then equal to true is true. Okay, so I'm sorry, this should say return true. If we've made it to the first if block, it should just say return true. We don't need this expression here. Similarly down here, we can just say return false. Is that right? Boolean B, if it was true, true equals true, that enters here. Yep, true equals equals false, that would be false. So the first return statement could be changed to return true. The second one could be changed to return false. That's maybe the first thing I would change. Then I'm realizing that because B can only either be true or false, it seems like this second if statement we don't even really need. If B was not equal to true, then we know B has to equal. If, if B not equals true was false, then we know that B, B equals equals true has to be true because those are the only two values for B to be. So what that means is we can actually probably just delete this if statement right here. And we can just ask if b is not equal to true, then we return true, else return false. But I think a shrewd programmer here would, would recognize I could actually probably replace this entire statement with the phrase um, return not b. Everything you see up here could be summarized with the expression return not be. Isn't that crazy? And furthermore, we actually wouldn't even need this method as all, at all as long as we had access to the logical operator not. So this, this leads me into kind of the theme of today's lesson, which is we want to talk about what's the right way to, to build Booleans, to have good logical Boolean zen. What are some of the pitfalls that people fall into? when they're trying to set up Booleans in. And then we have a couple other odds and ends we're going to take care of today. So we're going to discuss Booleans in. That's one of our first goals. We're going to use loops to analyze user input. And so it's going to be a combination of a user input loop, which we talked about in a recent lesson, and an if statement to qualify some of that input that the user gives us. That's another goal for today. We're going to learn the third and final way to print something to the console. You've heard of print. You've heard of print line. Well, today you get printf, and it is a narrower tool, but it does a great job of solving a problem of making sure complicated print statements are more easily handled. So I look forward to discussing printf. And then lastly, sort of the, the last remaining part of chapter four that we want to clean up is converting between types using wrapper classes. Wrapper classes. This is real code that a student turned into me about four years ago. And, you know, on one hand, you want to applaud effort, dedication. Um, you're talking about, that was a lot of keystrokes getting this all in. But as you look over this code, I think you can see it's just not very efficient. It's asking the question, if y-axis is 1, then return 0. And if y-axis is 2, return 1, y-axis is 3, return 2, so on and so forth. So basically, whatever the y-axis is, we need to just subtract one from it and return that value. So there's a lot of extra lines of code in here that are a little bit messy. So this is an example of something that would be bad zen. We can accomplish a very similar task with fewer lines of code. And the idea would be, Let's see here, int, 
this should be, I'm just realizing this should say minus one. Oh, and of course now it doesn't fit. Shrink it, there we go. All that code you saw on the previous slide could really be better summarized with this. Now, I've, the first few lines of code are the same. Get an input from the user, figure out where the space is in that input. That's what the, the other student did. And then we say input.substring of one comma space index. Basically, give me everything after the first character up until the space. And you'll actually see this code is for a project that we do later called VisiCalc, which is totally awesome. This line of code right here is actually a pretty clever way to, to trim out the part of the token that you need that's going to represent a number. But then rather than making a complex 10 if statement chain to say if it's 1 return 0, if it's 2 return 1, we can say take that string, that first token string, and pass it to a method called integer.parsint, which converts a string to an int for us. And converting between types is something we're going to talk about a little bit uh, later in today's lecture. But it's important to realize that we could accomplish this, all of those 10 um, if statements, each of them had two lines of code. So it's 30 lines of code we were able to reduce by understanding what's the correct tool for the job. We convert it to a number, we subtract one. That is the first token converted to an int, and then we return that. I know some students see an identifier like first token converted to an int, and they wanna know that seems a little bit wordy and ridiculous. Should my identifiers really be that long? And the answer is, yeah. I, I would way prefer an identifier that is this length compared to, you see way too many students still say things like int x or int thing or int stuff, int foo, int bar. Uh, those are just aren't descriptive. And I would rather us be a little bit over descriptive than not descriptive enough. Boolean Zen is about trying to clean up our if statements, especially as it pertains to returned values. And one rule that I recommend you write down, if you're taking notes, write down, thank you, right, right now. Thank you, my note takers, you know I appreciate you. A big Boolean Zen rule that's gonna help you is to try not to return a literal value. What does that mean? It means if you find yourself writing a return zero, return one, return two, or return true, return false, something like that, there is a chance that you've made a mistake, that you've picked something that is messy Boolean Zen. And what you're gonna aim to do instead is rather than return a literal value, like one, two, three, or true, false, what I recommend is try to figure out a way to return your statement in terms of a variable. If you can do that, then you are most likely saving yourself some lines of code. We're gonna see a lot of examples of this down the road. You're gonna hear me say the expression, try to return the variable, and maybe that'll give you an idea of what's going on. Um, I also wanted to comment, You know, I know some students are thinking to themselves, it, the way a return statement is built, aren't I allowed to just say, return and then integer.parsint of first token minus one. You can. These last two lines of code can be combined. Remember, I do think it's important in programming to try to express your intent as much as possible. And by declaring a variable called first token converted to int and then returning it, I tell the story of my thinking a little bit better. So both are acceptable, but if you find yourself getting confused with statements that are too long, Try to decompose them into two statements like I've done to tell the story of your code a little bit better. It'll probably help reduce confusion. So Boolean Zen is about having clean if statements, particularly when combined with return statements, and trying to return the variable instead of a literal value. That's, that's my impression of Boolean Zen. Okay, let's move on to the second topic, which is how do we combine together a user input loop and an if statement to qualify some input from the user. And what do I mean by qualify? I mean uh, to, to make a determination about input you've been given. So let's say we wanted to write a method that takes an integer n as a parameter and prompts the user for n names and prints the shortest one. So let's say uh, we're gonna get five names and you know we're given you know uh, Joni and Susan 
and Steve and Frank and whoever it is, we're going to figure out whose name is the shortest. So this is a challenge that I want you to try. I'm going to pause talking, write a method, takes an n, uh, it takes an int as a parameter called n, prompts the user for n names, figures out which one is the shortest. Try to write an answer out in your notebook. Give yourself two, three, four minutes. Pause the video here and then we will walk through the solution. All right, so some hints, if you're stuck, we should try to declare a variable to hold the shortest name and initialize it to the first string red. So we don't wanna make any assumptions about what the shortest name is. So we'll just say, we'll assume that the first name that we're given is the shortest until we find another one that's shorter. We'll use a for loop to process the string because we know how many times we wanna run, we wanna run n number of times then a while loop would not be appropriate. That's why we use the for loop here. And then once it's finished, we print out the shortest name. So here is the solution. Oh shoot, and I didn't. Oh, my version of the code uses a scanner to ask how many names we're gonna use. It, the, the, on the previous slide, it was supposed to say, um, we're supposed to provide num names as a parameter. So that's a slight discrepancy between my solution and the one from the previous slide. But the idea is still very much the same. We get the number of names we're going to ask for. We open up a scanner aimed at the user. And we say, all right, what's the shortest name? Let's grab the first name out of this list. And then we're going to ask more times how many names are there. What's the next name going to be? And then look at how we set up this if statement right here. If the next name I was given, if it's length, oh, there shouldn't be a space right there. If the next name I was given has a length that is shorter than the length of the shortest name, well then the shortest name should really be whatever the next name was I was given. So we finish this loop and when it's done, we will print out shortest name. A couple of things I wanna comment on, look at how I set up my for loop, initialization, test and update. I set i equals one, i less than n. Think to yourself, why did I set i equals one instead of i equals zero? What would the reason be? Hopefully you said to yourself, because we already took one name out, we can skip the first name and we wanna start right with the second name. So if the number of names was five, we took care of name one right here, and so we just wanna do names two, three, and four, and five in the for loop. So this is an example of how we can get a user input loop where we have a scanner aimed at the user. We are looping to get repeated outputs. We take those outputs like next name and we determine something about them, right? If I asked instead for us to make the code that does the longest name, we could probably do that. Or if I asked for code that counted how many names start with the letter A, we could probably do that too. So there's an opportunity to use a combination of scanners for user input, loops for getting repeated user input, and then if statements to learn something about those inputs. That's kind of the takeaway of this slide. Okay, I want you to imagine, we're transitioning on to topic number three. I want you to imagine you're making a video game. In a video game, you've got an enemy goblin, and you need to print out to your player, to your user, information about the goblin. So you say goblin, goblin name has hit points and attacks hero with goblin weapon. Now look at that statement. That is grotesque, right? Like look at all the concatenation and variable work I have to do there. It's really a headache. And just typing that, right? Getting the combination of space quote, space plus space, name of variable space. I mean, it, it would just be a real headache. So it's gonna happen from time to time in programming that you're gonna to wanna to make a print statement that has a lot of variables in it. And usually what it is is what I call a diagnostic print statement. If there's a part of my code I think is broken, I'll make a print statement that prints out a bunch of variable values so I can see if everything is what I think it's gonna be. So whether you are printing information for your user 
whether, whether you're trying to diagnose a bug in your program and you want to see all your variable values at a particular point, uh, we need to have a better way to print something to the screen that won't um, take so much many keystrokes, right? That, that looks a little bit cleaner. So here's an equivalent statement in printf. Goblin percent %s has percent %d and attacks percent %s with percent %s. And then you'll notice I put a whack n, the escape sequence there at the end of that string. I'll talk about that in a second. But then check this out. When the string is done, so I always start out a printf statement with, with some expression in quotes, a string literal in quotes. When that's done, I say comma, and then every variable I would like to substitute in gets named. So we've got goblin name, hit points, hero, goblin weapon. And these variables will get substituted into the order in which I called for them. So this percent %s, percent %d, percent %s, percent %s, this is saying, give me the first variable, it should be a string. Give me the second variable, it should be a digit, or what we really mean by that is an int. Give me the third variable, it should be a string. Give me the fourth variable, it should be a string. And you'll notice that I am not juggling quotes and pluses and a whole bunch of stuff. The two statements are equivalent and they read, the second one reads much, much better. I want to comment that you probably noticed if there's a whack n at the end of my expression, that means that printf is like print. It is not like print line. It does not go down to the new line for you at the end of the text you've printed. Instead, you have to call for it if you want that. That is one attribute of printf that we should be aware of. So what is printf in general? It's another way to print out statements. It's like print and print line. You have to use escape sequences to go to the new line. It can do some formatting for you, which I'm about to talk about to help make your code look, uh, your printed output can look really pretty. And it can control the width of the space that you print out. You're about to see that. The precision of decimal statements. And it can even align your output for you. It can align it left, it can align it right. Um, it can do a whole bunch of stuff. So if I have, for example, a variable x, which is an int, a variable y, which is an int, I can substitute them into this printf statement by calling for percent digit, percent %d. And that would print out x is 3 and y is negative 17. So how do we use some of these extra cool formatting tricks? Well, I guess actually first let me back up and say, what are the things that we can substitute in? There's really only three values I want you to worry about. d is for digit or integer. So if you are substituting in a whole number, positive or negative, you'll use percent %d. If you want to refer, refer to a real number, that is a decimal, You'll do F, and you might have guessed that F stands for float. That's right, it's a floating point decimal number. And then S is for string. And the format is, we say system.out.printf, just like you have your other print statements, but it's print F. And then inside the parentheses, you say your string with your substitutions, and then you separate by commas all of the things that you're substituting in. I don't know if there is a limit to the number of variables you could substitute, I am sure it is higher than anything you would reasonably do. Probably in the hundreds would be my guess. So why else is, oh, excuse me. Why else is printf really cool? I will tell you, um, you can control the width of your output. Meaning you can say, I want you to substitute this variable in, but when you do, make sure it takes up a certain width of space. So if I put, you see this capital W right here? If I say percent %wd, what I'm saying this w value is must take up a minimum number of that spaces. So here we have nested for loops where i goes from one to three, j goes from one to 10, and we wanna print out, every time this prints, we print out i times j. So we're making ourselves a little multiplication table, right? and we ask for percent %4d. The way Java interprets this is it says, look, whatever i times j is, take up four spaces. So I've got one, only took up one space, so Java provided three spaces to its left. All of the single digit numbers did that. But then as soon as we got to 10, it recognized that 10 was two spaces, and printf was smart enough to just finish out that padding by giving me two right there. 
So putting a number between the percent and whatever letter you've chosen, whether it's a D, an F, or an S, whatever variable type you're substituting in, will give you a little bit of a padded space. And you can see how in the output down below here, it is really clean and nice looking. If you want to, you can put a negative in front of your number, and instead of being right aligned, it'll become left aligned. We've all written essays before. You guys have all used a word processor, whether it's Microsoft Word or Google Docs or whatever it is. Uh, you understand left aligned, right aligned, justified, same ideas here. Uh, these are all right aligned, which you can see how everything is lining up on its right edge. If you ask for a width of four, that means that the minimum width must be four. And if you try to print out something that has like a width of uh, 10, it'll just take all 10 spaces, which means it might throw off the alignment of your output. So if you ask for a width of four and you print out a bunch of things that are width of four, you probably wanna make sure that nothing has a width greater than four because that'll throw off the, the prettiness of your output. So a number between the percent and the character determines a minimum width that you have to take up. You can also, if you're, and this is just for floating numbers, you can put a point and then a D for digit for a number of decimals and that will do rounding for us. I think all of us have probably gotten a little bit fed up with how clunky uh, spitting out a double is and it, it does all these decimal places. If you've been looking for a clean and easy way to round your output, this is the way to do it. Uh, it only works with float. You cannot round a string. You cannot round an integer. Um, I don't know why you would try. It would be very silly. So you say percent dot D, D for the number of decimal places, F. So if I have uh, GPAs 3.25, blah, blah, blah. If I try to substitute GPA in and I say 0.1, then it will give me one decimal place. And notice how it rounded 0.25. It rounded that correctly up to 0.3. I can ask for three decimal places and it'll give me point, uh, 3.254. The 3.7 got rounded up to a four correctly. And you'll notice in my second example, I actually combined the two um, qualifying inputs for printf together. I gave a width, a minimum width that it needed to be, and I gave it a number of decimal places. So I said, look, this needs to take up eight spaces, and I need three decimal places. I combine that together. And if you wanted, you could actually combine all three techniques. You could say uh, left align, a minimum width of to dot this many decimal places. Again, width and left alignment can be done with F, D, or S, any of the variable types it works. The dot D for decimal places only works with floats. And when you're working with a float, you can use one or all of these techniques to, to change your output. Print F helps you make your print, your print statements turn out pretty and nicely aligned. So it's useful for that. And it makes it easier to print variables so you don't have to do the concatenation game. Um, I find if I'm concatenating one variable, I still just use percent plus and then the variable because that's pretty easy. If I'm printing out more than one variable, that's when I'll go ahead and go to printf in general. Or if I care about my code occupying a minimum width or being right aligned or anything like that, then I'll use printf for that tool. Otherwise, you know, 98% of the time, you're still just going to use print and print line. But have this tool in your back pocket for when you need it. All right, so the last thing we wanna talk about in today's lecture is how to convert between types. We've done a little bit of this work before, but we wanna make sure that we have uh, the remaining tools to get it done. So we knew that we could explicitly cast one value to another if they were both primitives, we know this works, I can take this 3.0, I can cast it to an int, save it to an int variable. This is an example of an explicit cast. Both these statements in the top right-hand corner are examples of implicit casting. The int for trying to get assigned to a double D. Java is smart enough to know that for has an equivalent double value called 4.0, and so it will implicitly cast this for to a 4.0 and save that in D, hooray. Uh, Java is smart enough to know if I add 3.7 and 5, 
that the double equivalent of 5 is 5.0, and now that they're both doubles, we can add 3.7 and 5, getting 8.7. And that was an example also of an implicit cast where 5 got changed to 5.0 without our explicitly ask, asking like we did over here. Um, there are a couple of ways to switch um, as long as we're still talking about primitives. We've talked a lot recently about how every letter and symbol in Java has a numerical equivalent on the ASCII table. Capital A is 65, capital B is 66, so on and so forth. Well, if I say uh, the character A plus zero, I think lowercase a is, oh, I always get this wrong. I think it's 96. It's either 96 or 97. But what Java sees here is it sees a char and it sees an int. It does the same thing it did with a double and an int. And it says, you know what? Uh, in order to combine these, it works if they're both ints. So A gets converted to, I think it's 97, 97 plus zero. So we're able to store an int J 97. So if the default is combining an int and a char makes them both an ints, how do you go the other way? How do you get an, um, how do you get a char out of an int? And you can actually explicitly cast an int and it'll turn into a char. So for instance, char of 67, remember we said 65 was A, capital A, 66 is capital B, 67 is capital C. So char C would actually hold a capital C right now. So we know up until this point, we can go double to int, int to double. We can go char to int, int to char. The reason the conversion between types has been easy up until this point is because we're working with primitives. Primitives take very little data in memory. They have numerical equivalents. They're easy to change between. The difference is when we start going to other types is it gets really complicated. So if you need to convert between something that is not a primitive and another type, you should tap the brakes and make sure you've got the right tool. Two examples that we've got right here are uh, int to string and string to int. So int to string, the easiest way to convert something to a string is you can just add a string to it. And even if you want to, you can just add the empty string and that will promote its type essentially, right? So this was a three, int three plus string three makes string 33. So yeah has 33 in it. And if I wanted to, I didn't even need to put the three in the quotes right here. I could just say three plus quote, quote, three plus the empty string and convert that up to a string, which is pretty cool. Going the other direction is different. If I need to go from a string to an int, I need to go get a particular tool. And in this case, if, if you haven't been taking much notes, this line of code down at the bottom right here is the line of code to write down much right, right now. Integer.parseInt of number 42 as long as what's in the string right here can be represented with an int, job, this, this method parse int will take that string and will return its int equivalent. So if I tried to pass in one underscore two slash three to an integer parse int, it would crash because it doesn't know what number that's supposed to be. 123, one and two thirds, it, it doesn't know. But if I'm just passing in one or two or three, uh, and that's all that's in there, something that is numerically can make an int, then you'll get that value back. So what is integer? What is parse int? These are examples of something called wrapper classes. I would write these four down. When you look at these four, you're probably thinking to yourself, geez, those, uh, those look an awful lot like our primitive values. Um, what's, what's going on there? And the answer is they are, each of these classes is holds one little primitive value, but it has a class wrapped around it. So this comes back to our conversation we had earlier about the difference between classes and objects and the difference between a primitive and a non-primitive type. Remember, primitives hold a simple piece of information and they don't have access to methods. They can't perform any tasks. But there would be times that we want something that holds a primitive piece of information to perform a method, to perform a function for us. And so in order to accomplish that task, we have these wrapper classes. So an integer holds a single int inside of it. 
And But what's cool is because it's not an int, it's an integer. It's like the super form of an int. It can perform cool functions for us. Um, and it's true, actually, that just like the math class, whose methods are static, meaning that we don't have to declare a math object to use the math methods. We can just say math.random, math.max, math.abs, right? Uh, the methods that we're going to use from these wrapper classes are also static, meaning that even though you could declare an integer object or a double object or a character object or a Boolean object, even though you could, you often won't need to because you're just going to go ahead and call these methods from this class. So notice how integer, double, and Boolean, they all have parse methods that take a string and return whatever type it was you were looking for. Integer.parseInt gives you an int. Double.parseDouble gives you a double. Boolean.parseBoolean gives you a Boolean. And Character.charValue returns a char. So when we talk about how to convert types, going between primitives should be pretty good. And now we should be able to go from any primitive to a string by just adding the empty string to it, right? We just promote it by concatenating an empty string. And now we can go from any string back to these primitive types, right? If you've got a string and it's a double, you can say double.parse double and it'll convert that to a double for you. The thing I want to emphasize is if you try to ask one of these methods to parse something that's the wrong form, if you say integer.parseInt mango, it is going to give you, I think, what's called an input mismatch exception, which means you asked to convert something that wasn't the right type. So Java is trusting you right here to feed it a string that does have an equivalent that it can use. We're going to talk more about the wrapper classes later um, because they can hold a value, because we can make objects of them. Um, they'll have other uses for us, specifically in the ArrayList um, unit, which is chapter 10. Um, but for right now, you can just use their static parse methods to convert strings to the type that you need. That's the reason we're talking about wrappers today. Uh, a couple of other character methods I think you're going to find useful so you can ask for uh, the numerical value of a character. So if you want to convert a char to an int, uh, character.getNumericalValue, passing a char right here is good. And you can ask if a particular character, notice how all of these inputs are chars, you can ask true or false. Is it a digit? Is it a letter? Is it lowercase? Is it uppercase? The last four of these all return a Boolean true or false if the char that you've passed in meets a particular criteria. Again, these are helpful methods, static methods you can call right from the character class, take a parameter and return a value that can be useful to us. All right, uh, this is our homework. It's also gonna be posted online. I'll let you get started on that. And thanks for watching.